morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Community Lutheran Church. I'm Betty Molinsky, pastor of the Spy Group of Disciples, and yes, now I have a mic because my ear microphone is broken. So, so that you can all hear me and you can all we can all experience the wonderful joys of worship service together. I'd like to thank you again for being here. And I would invite the choir to begin us with worship. God and Father of all. We confess that we have sinned against you and thought our worthy We have thought better of ourselves than others. We have told lies and hurtful things, acted in ways we wish we could take back, and looked the other way when action was needed. In your mercy, O oh God, forgive us, cleanse us, and heal us for the sake of Jesus our Savior. Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away and everything has become new. In Christ, my brothers and sisters, you are all new creations. Your sins are taken away and you have been made new. Therefore, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Amen. It is then with great joy and thanksgiving we move on into the rest of our worship service by singing hymn number 641. Thank you. 
rejoice before God. Hallelujah. With tongues of fire, the Spirit kindles the apostles' zeal. They declare the new tongues of the wonderful works of God. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be His kingdom now and forever. Hallelujah. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful people with your love. Hallelujah.
Today's first reading is from the 11th chapter of Jeremiah, found on page 622 of the Pew Bibles. In it we hear of the suffering of the prophet Jeremiah, who announced God's word to Judah, but was met with intense opposition and persecution. Jeremiah continues to trust in God in the midst of his suffering. A reading from the 11th chapter of Jeremiah, beginning with the 18th verse. It was the Lord who made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their evil deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not know it was against me that they devised schemes, saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, so that his name will no longer be remembered. But you, O Lord of hosts, who judge righteously, who try the heart and the mind, let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please turn to page 338 of your red hymnals and page forward to Psalm 54. <coughs> we will read responsibly. Save me, O God, by your name. In your might, defend my cause. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen up against me, and the ruthless have sought my life, those who have no regard for God. Behold, God is my helper. It is the Lord who saves my life. Render evil to those who spy on me. In your faithfulness, destroy them. I will offer you a freedom. and my eye looks down upon my enemies. Our second reading is from the third chapter of James, found on page 982 of the Pew Bibles. In it we learn that the wisdom of God, though the wisdom God gives, unites hearts and minds. Instead of living to satisfy our own wants and desires, we manifest this wisdom in peace, gentleness, mercy, and impartiality toward others. A reading from the third chapter of James, the third and fourth, actually goes into the fourth, third and fourth chapter of James, verse 13 through chapter 4, verse 3, and then moving on to verse 7 to 8. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without a trace of partiality or his hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? They do not come from your cravings that are at war. Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. 
You covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel acclamation. <laughs> Like it or not, 
whether I like it or not, whether the world likes it or not, the first, the last shall be first, and the first last. To welcome the least, last, and lost, the weak, the powerless, the helpless, the ones who receive more than they give, is to welcome Jesus. As the disciples were busy strategizing over the concept of personal greatness, and that was, that's what was going on in this text, Jesus presents to them a new thought, a new organizational chart on, in the kingdom of um, God, and children were the weakest, or at the top of his chart. This idea was radical, and it flew in the face of conventional thought of the day. Children in Jesus' time, servants in Jesus' time, the weak, the least, the lost, did not count for much and fared poorly when it came to respect. We call them the marginalized. These folks had no legal status, no productive capabilities, the least valued members of society. They could be sold off, punished, or even killed by their father or by their master. <coughs> Jewish children seemed to fare better, on the other hand, but even they were diminished socially and religiously. In Mark 10, verses 13 to 16, we hear of the disciples showing away the children or the least, the last, and the lost from Jesus. Children can also be used or called servants in this text. Even today are not viewed as fundamentally human, are they? For children, we seem to always be training them to be something in the future, rather than accepting them for the blessings that they are. We seem today to always be looking for people to do and be more than they are, instead of blessing them and being appreciative for the blessings that they bring. The least, the last, and the lost. Jesus decides in today's gospel to use the common thinking about children, the least, the last, and the lost, as a teaching tool for his disciples. Now, whenever Jesus wants to have a good teaching moment with his disciples, he usually ends up in a house or someplace that's quiet, like a church, where people can be gathered together and you can be pretty sure that the instruction that's going to come is significant. It really does sound like a church, doesn't it? Think about it. Are we called into this quiet place to hear the prophetic words of Jesus? Jesus did this with his disciples. It's only natural we would do this as a church. It calls us to a time of quiet, a place where the disciples and us are gathered around the Word of God with an un, hopefully an undivided attention, free from hopefully distract, hopefully free from distracting pressures and issues of the world, so that we can hear the words of Jesus. Now, on this particular day, that is Jesus' time with the disciples. On this particular day. The disciples had been silent. They had grown quiet, which was unusual. But they grew quiet after a discussion that they had had amongst themselves, not with Jesus, but amongst themselves about who was greatest. Why did they get silent after this? Was there some shame? Was there some embarrassment? Was there some personal disgust at their willingness to argue in a self-aggrandizing style, instead of pondering what Jesus had just told them last week, which was that he was going to die, and that he as the Messiah would be put to death. They weren't pondering that. They were pondering who would be the greatest among them. Hmm. No matter the reason for their silence, Jesus decides to take them to a new reality. 
the new reality we talked about last week. This week, the reality that Jesus brings to us is this. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Mm. Jesus points the disciples in a new reality and the kingdom of God is now a community with new priorities where the least, the last, and the lost come first. Not the typical order of things, then or now. Jesus takes the typical, natural order of things, such as rank and status, and flips them upside down. Didn't we just talk about that in Bible study today? Isn't it interesting how all that worked together? Jesus turns things upside down and causes us to pause and ponder. Do we do care for the least? the last, and the lost. The servant of Jesus is a servant Messiah. He's coming to a time, he's telling his disciples, when he will illustrate how his servant's state will bring him to his death. The Son of God is about to completely enter, empty himself, taking the form of an innocent servant, humbling himself, and dying for us. He willingly walks into the place of the least, the last, and the lost. He does not ask for greatness. He asks to serve. Jesus was speaking to his disciples as a servant who, like a child, was on the powerless end of life. Now, he did that by choice. Some do not, some prefer to think that this Jesus could never be powerless, but he did choose this. He chose the powerless state of the least, <coughs> the last, and the lost. He placed himself at the mercies of others. Jesus not only embraces this servant role, he identifies himself with what he calls are the most innocent, which is the child. And he tells his disciples this, whoever welcomes one such as this, in my name, welcomes me. Disciples, both then and now, can choose to treat the child, the servant, the least, the last, and the lost, in such a way as to measure their own faith and love in Jesus. The choice is ours. Now since the shoes did not fit my feet, and since I could not make the sermon text about children, something happened on Thursday. And I know these things are always God sent. And so I need to tell you what happened. I was working here till late on Thursday, and doggone, I was really busy. I was really busy. Did you know it's just almost Advent and Christmas? I mean, you all think, oh, she's crazy. But no, really. <laughs> there's services to plan. They have a whole lot of things to do, and there's bunches of wonderful things going on. I didn't want to be bothered, and I really didn't want to be bothered by the least, the last, and the lost. And so I started getting phone calls from someone we have helped in the past, a woman. Now, whenever I know that she calls, I kind of want to say I'm not here, but I take her calls. And, and this church, through the pastor's discretionary fund, has been wonderful about supporting this family's needs. Now, some folks say we help too much. Well, you know, what's too much, folks? You know, did Jesus ever tell one of us you're asking too much? I don't think so. But still, Tom Glenn, I felt like she was asking too much. I was tired of this. I had work to do. This least last and lost thing as I was trying to carve out of the sermon text. <clears throat> Here she was on the phone again five times, she called. And I finally told Char she couldn't answer the phone anymore because I knew who it was. Didn't I, Char? Didn't I tell you? I knew who I was. I was going to deal with her. I was convincing and carrying on about it. 
And finally I paused and I thought, you know, I need to be Jesus on this moment in the sense I need to ask for what is her problem. And I finally did. And she wasn't asking for herself. She was asking for her husband. He's disabled. And he needed help. Mm. And of course there's always money involved. And it's never as easy as just whisking my hand and saying, okay, you have money. It's about getting it to her. It's about paying the bills for the transit company that needs the money so that he can get to the medical um, facilities for his care. It's never easy. It's always a detailed experience. But you know, there are the less and the loss. And so I took care of what needed to be done. I wrote the, I wrote the letters. I took care of the, the expenses. And I moved on, still grumbling. Well, apparently I'm not supposed to be grumbling about this. And so I end up getting someone else at my door. Because I didn't get it the first time. I didn't get the message the first time. I was apparently being given something to use in a sermon experience here. Because I was still trying to get the shoe in the, the foot in the shoe as far as trying to talk about children today. and just wasn't going. And so when the second person came and her needs were presented to me, I blew her off. You know why? All I could think of was, now how am I going to explain to the good people of Community Lutheran Church who supply the, in, uh, supply the support for this pastor's social relief fund? I mean, y'all are going to wonder if I'm nuts or if I'm just standing around throwing that money to whoever's asking who was ever saying they're least last or lost. So, most of these people, by the way, when they do come to me, have been refused by the pilot center. So, I really didn't have time for this. But I thought, perhaps, I needed to take the time. And so she went out to her car and was crying when I said no. And I called her back. And I listened. And I simply gave her what she asked for was time to see if we could help the least, the last, and the lost. And we could. And so we did. And after I talked with her and prayed with her, and no, we will probably not see her children in Sunday school, but she went out with prayer, and she went out with a sense of God's grace. And I sat down and I thought, whoever welcomes the least of me welcomes me. You ever have one of those humbling moments in mind where you suddenly have it go through your soul and you go, ah, now this fits, I understand. And it is an upside down radical thought, isn't it, friends? Whoever welcomes the least of me welcomes me. So we did, but not after fighting, because I didn't want to. But whoever welcomes the least of me welcomes me. <coughs> and so to God glory, to God's glory. The prophetic message of today, my friends, is yours and it's mine. Whoever welcomes the least of me without questions. welcomes me. Think about it. I am. Amen. We rise to the end of the day. Seven twelve.
the words of the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> we believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. Who has spoken through the prophets? We believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As disciples of Christ Jesus, called to love and serve all people, let us pray for the church, those in need and all of God's creation. <clears throat> 